Hi, everybody. I'm beyond thrilled and frankly intimidated to be speaking with you all this afternoon. Ironically, in a track that is centered around diversity, I am one of two Adrians you're going to hear from in this session, so please don't hold it against us. Um, my name is Adrian Marcino, and I'm the director of business development at Terry and Sandy in New York. And a little about us. We're 50 people strong, ad age's small agency of the year, and the second most effective independent agency in North America. We're fortunate to have a bevy of remarkable brands on our roster, like Nutella, Nestle, Disney, and so many more that we love. And one more thing that I'm especially proud of in this group today. Terry and Sandy is one of the few creatively led, women-owned agencies in our industry. After 20 years in the big agency world, Terry Meyer and Sandy Greenberg decided to forge their own path and found their own agency with diversity and female empowerment baked into the core of its DNA. And diversity at Terry and Sandy has always meant that we hire a melting pot, that we welcome differences and different perspectives. But I love what Wade Davis said earlier. To us, diversity at a deeper level means that we truly mean, we truly understand what it means to celebrate people and their stories so that they can bring their whole phenomenal selves to work every day. And being able to bring your whole self to work every day is important because studies show that those who feel they can be their authentic selves in the workplace are not only more optimistic, but they're more effective at their jobs. And at Terry and Sandy, this has manifested itself in actionable ways. We believe it's a verb, and it has to be used to create better, more authentic work. We must view our jobs as agents of culture. And although you'll hear many perspectives on the importance of diversity in the workplace over these sessions and days, today I'm going to share with you what we have successfully done in regards to LGBTQ plus representation for clients big and small. Starting with one of my favorites. Um, Barba uh, is a barber, it's a high-end barber shop in New York City who believes that doing well in business means doing good in the community. It is a place where a client can not only get an amazing style, but make a positive impact on the world at the same time. Over the years, we've worked on a number of important campaigns with them um, for men's health and other initiatives, but most recently, we launched a campaign that helped impact the trans community and not only our progressive little bubble of New York City, but around the world. Strands for Trans is a campaign that was born of our creative team learning and understanding what the experience for a trans man or a trans woman is like in a barbershop or a salon. Very often, they can be mistreated, denied service, or openly harassed for being authentically themselves. And not a group to sit idly by, we got to work to create a movement that didn't just ride the coattails of pride, but celebrated the trans community and worked to make an actionable difference. Our campaign had a two-pronged approach. The first is that we needed to let the world know that this was such an epidemic. We needed to let people know that trans men and women were facing these sorts of problems. And the second was we needed to aim to fix it. We needed to encourage barbershops and salons across the country to sign up as trans-friendly businesses in the first digital registry of its kind. In order to promote our movement, we launched our campaign in June during Pride Month, first offering clients a free hairdo of uh, the colors inspired by the trans flag, pink, white, and blue. We then created a huge amount of content promoting our movement, which got the attention of celebrities like Marc Jacobs that helped further spread the word and enhance the power of our movement. And most importantly, it worked. We not only raised incredible awareness to the media and the PR that this effort garnered, we were able to meaningfully change the experience that trans men and women had in the salon chair every day. As you can see on the screens around the room, within two weeks of launch, we had shops registered in all 50 states, in Canada, and Mexico, and Europe. But it's not just the small, inherently bold brands on your roster that can make an impact. It is important to empower your people to bring their whole passionate selves to work so they can influence your larger, maybe even more conservative clients to influence the work that they release into the world. An example of one of our largest and longest standing partnerships is with the Walt Disney Company's princess franchise, Cinderella, Pocahontas, Mulan, La whole gang. And because we have forged a partnership with Disney over the years that is built on trust and mutual success, we're always working to push one another to create work that is more and more reflective of the people that love the princesses. And so when it came time to celebrate the Little Mermaid's 30th birthday, we worked with Disney to create an anthem that showcases the full spectrum of fans that love Ariel. The piece is a rendition of the song, Part of Your World, and is cast with real fans in the movie, no actors. Here's a quick little sample. Can you try to learn that Ariel had been? I love the Little Mermaid. Alice. 
always wanted to be her. <laughs> her hair is blue and <laughs> I know, I love this campaign. So that's just the 15. Um, the next time you guys need a really good, cathartic, ugly cry, take a look at the three minute version on our website. And because these are real people, that is that boy's real Ariel costume, and that couple really does sing Ariel songs, that's incredible. Um, and although the two campaigns I chose to use as examples today are very different in subject matter and size and scope, they have a number of key similarities that I feel made them destined for success right from the start. First, they were stories that were told with LGBTQ plus staff members either leading the charge or key voices at the table throughout the entire creative process, from conception to completion. This is where enabling people to bring their full selves to work is critically important. It makes for better, truer storytelling. And second, we did not aim to pander or profit from the LGBTQ plus community. And you guys know exactly what this looks like. It's slapping a rainbow flag on something just for the month of June so you can say you did something for pride. Instead, we told real stories, worked to make clear, specific, and actionable differences, and represented people in honest ways and in their own voices. We want to encourage people to speak for themselves whenever possible. And all right, 3%. Thank you so much for the past six minutes and 40 seconds of your time. It was an absolute honor to speak with you this afternoon. My name is Adrian. Thank you. On the count of three, I want everyone in the room to say yes. One, two, three. Yes. Great. Let me tell you what you just agreed to. Number one. <laughs> You will all show up as your authentic self. Number two, you will always be the person who is active and open and free for new identity. And number three, you will help me make Pecha Kucha great again. Okay, so we all know that Pecha Kucha is the Japanese phrase that means, um, that means chit chat. It means how, you know, it, it's the 20 second, 20 slide thing, but for me, when I first heard it, I was thinking, what in the world is Kucha and who in the hell wants to pet it? <laughs> my name is Adrienne C. Smith, and DNI is in my DNA. I am the daughter of a mother who kneels down in prayer by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Next to my father who faces the east and says, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Can you imagine the Christmas holiday at my house? I mean, that's where I learned the ultimate deal with compromise. We never had a Christmas tree. We always had a Christmas couch. We never gave my dad a Christmas present, but we made sure that every December 25th, he had new underwear and new socks. My dad would always say, never forget the things that you are supposed to remember. And as I think about this movement of diversity and inclusion, I recall two pivotal mo moments in the advertising industry that have created the underpinnings for who we are today and set the course for our forward fo focus. In 1998, the Madison Avenue Initiative was created in response to the radio rep firm, Cats Media, who had instructed their people and provided guidelines against the urban radio stations programmed for minorities. The memo suggested reminding buyers that they want, to to, they want to target prospects and not suspects for their clients. In 2008, the Madison Avenue Project released a report called the Discrimination Divide. This report revealed racial discrimination was 38% worse in the ad industry compared to the U.S. labor market. There were less African Americans in leadership position and the same thing with women which led to the 2020 EEOC, EEOC, um, what is it called? The EEOC, um, tell me, anybody, the EEOC, thank you, against the ad industry. So in 20, between 2010 and 2020, there have been diversity initiatives, there have been talks, there have been, you know, anything that you can think of, forums that have been targeted to help diverse communities. In 2018, I took a stab and did my own. I started the Can Can Diversity Collective, which created opportunities for young people um, in mid to senior level, level positions to be a part of the Can International Festival of Creativity. In the first year, we took five young people. In 2019, we took 25 young people, and we also created the first 
diversity and inclusion activation in the 66 year history of the Can Lions. Inkwell Beach was created to create, to be a part, Inkwell Beach was created so that each of us could have an opportunity and stop the co-opting of our culture. We had speakers like Gail King, Naomi Campbell, Mark Reed, and the first family of Inkwell was, D was Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union. We had over 100 speakers. 66% were people of color, 35 from, from 35 different countries, six continents. So if there's anyone out there who can help us with Antarctica, please let me know. And of course, we had nine hours of daily programming. If I have to say, my so -so, say so myself, we did the damn thing. As I see it, for the last 30 years, we've acted in 10-year cycles for equality, diversity, and inclusion in the advertising industry. As we enter this next decade of this movement, we have a critical decision to make. Do we focus on building plans for the future, or do we take action now? The notion of now is not the place for, the notion of the future is not the place for DNI. But we must be forward focused. The notion of the future gives too many of us an out that provides life for the status quo. The future has no guarantees. Now is the time to act, and society is telling us why we must act now. Where there's Gucci Gate or the horrors of H&M, we must act now or we will be bound to repeat all of the bad behavior. Now is the time, not the future. Why must we act now? On November 13th, 2019, your ability to protect your rights or sue for discrimination as a person of color, gender, or from the LBGTQ plus community, or even the disabled community will be challenged. This act provides protection for fair commercial and government contracting. It is your right for economic inclusion. Why must we act now? Diverse voices have to be in the room to speak out when brands attempt to use social cause inappropriately to sell a product. There's a stark difference when brands identify with a cause trying to capitalize or trying to capitalize on a cause. Just ask Alicia Montano about being woke, the woke wash effect. Her answer might make you think she's crazy. Best intention brands still suffer from systemic issues of discrimination. Although some brands appear to be down for efforts, but are always not, it's not always the core of their organization. We must act now. Now we must be forward focused. We must come up with the right formula at that ad industry's version of escape velocity. You know that speed of an object that you have to, in order to escape the gravitational field of without, without falling back for destruction. We need to have that same escape velocity for the advertising industry. So never forget the things that you are supposed to remember. Past d &I efforts have not failed. They just have not reached that escape velocity threshold. We still have the opportunity to be the change we want to see. We must show, us our, our, we must show up as our authentic selves and don't talk about it. We must be about it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Weaver, and in the wake of Me Too, I launched an Instagram account and called it HR Uprise. At the time, I was looking back on my experiences, both as a woman in the working world and as an HR professional, and I was becoming to understand what my experiences were for what they really were. At the time, I was also watching organizations like Time's Up being formed, and I'm hearing headlines of even more prominent people coming forward. I'm hearing women like Gretchen Carlson say things like, if you're harassed, don't go to HR. And as much as it hurts me as an HR person to hear that, the sad reality is it's pretty good advice in a lot of cases. So I launched with a really direct message to HR about, quite frankly, how we need to get our shit together, about how we've been complicit and yet, one of the things that surprised me and yet continues to come up over and over and over again are the number of non-HR employees who keep reaching out to me. They're asking questions like, I was asked to sign an NDA, what should I know? What happens if I find out that a bunch of my coworkers make a lot more money than I do? 
what happens um, if I finally decide to leave a toxic work environment? And how do I tell this story when I go interview for a new company? I don't want anybody to get fired. I just want it to stop. What do I do? And I'm thinking to myself, these are the kinds of questions that I've been answering for my friends and family for years. I call it the HR phone a friend, right? Because I'm truly independent, and I can give them the real scoop. I mean, for these people who are reaching out to me, I think, man, if you had an HR partner you trusted, you wouldn't have to reach out to me, someone who, in effect, is a total stranger on the internet. So I realize that in HR, we need to confront a fundamental truth about this profession, the one that I've, by the way, loved to hate for about 20 years now. Trust in HR is at an all-time low. A recent survey of about 12,000 employees in the best companies to work for revealed that on average, 70% of employees said they don't trust HR. And why? Well, one of my theories is that we have gotten completely misguided on what the role of HR really is. Ask most people and they'll say, they're an employee advocate. And yet, the truth is, we're not. In HR, we say what's best for the employee and what's best for the company don't have to be mutually exclusive. And it's true, but it's also beside the point. So now with every talk I give on behalf of HR Uprise, I have a line of people lining up to tell me the stories about how they've been burned by HR. And why do they feel burned? Because they went looking for that employee advocate, and what they found was a company representative. This is a feature, not a bug. The system is working exactly as it is supposed to. And yet, we're all out here still fighting against this. So to any of my fellow HR people in the crowd who might still be fighting against this, like I did, I want you to think about how many conversations have you had with employees where you thought in the back of your head, I really wish I could tell them this. For me, it was too many to count. And that right there is the evidence that your primary obligation is to the company, not to the employee that you're talking to. Nine times out of 10, it is the company that you're protecting by whatever that is that you wish you could tell them. I think it's really critical for us to be honest about this fundamental truth. I think we're kidding ourselves if we think we can move on without some serious reflection. And if we can't figure out how to create safe workspaces for every employee, we don't have the right to talk about anything else. We have to address sexual harassment and discrimination in the workplace. So I was asked to talk about what's HR 2.0? Where are we in the future? So I'm going to talk about that a little bit too. Today, the face of HR is a 47-year-old white woman, like by far. No, no word on how many cats she owns. Um, <laughs> one for me. <laughs> HR has a diversity problem just like every other profession. And the future of HR is going to be shaped by how much we are willing to put our money where our mouth is. We know our decisions are shaped by the environment in which we operate. And we can only begin to regain trust if we commit ourselves. We've been trying to cram too much into one job description. It is totally unrealistic to expect the same person or even team to be responsible for benefits administration, talent management, workforce planning, and investigation for misconduct. In the future, we're going to see these roles even further specialized. And it should be said, diversity and inclusion belongs on its own. I see in-house and HR teams splitting. So all of the administrative stuff, that's going to be automated. All the stuff we used to think of as HR. Now we're going to see teams focused on culture, talent management and development, and workforce planning and recruiting. But we cannot expect the same person to be responsible for employee development and investigating conduct. So imagine this, a true separation where the person or team responsible for investigating conduct actually reports to the board of directors, not the CEO. Look, until fundamental changes are made, and until we really look at how HR operates, we are going to have to continue to rely on outside pressures to actually affect change. So we can kill off Diet Madison Avenue all we want, something else will pop up in its place. And there are a few too many breathing a sigh of relief right now that they've gone quiet. So for me, 
I'm focused full time now on addressing the original question that I began with, which is, who is serving employees? Rest assured, I have no interest in naming names myself, but I have every interest in supporting the people who do. So I'm going to continue to open the doors to the way things operate to try and level the playing field just a little bit. Far too much is stacked in favor of the company. The bar for harassment and discrimination legally is way too high, and the cost for attorneys is as well. So I'm building a platform to give people access to coaches and give access to this inside baseball. But here's the deal. As leaders, there's good news. You still have time. You can be part of the solution. You can put me out of business. I would love that. The real future of HR, the real employee advocate, really should be you. And until we actually begin to act that way, I'll be out here leading the uprise. Thank you.